Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager for Dataversity. We want to thank you for joining the latest in the monthly webinar series, Data Architecture Strategies with Donna Burbank. Today, Donna will be joined by a special guest, Becky Russell, to present Data Modeling at the Environment Agency of England, a case study. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. And we very much encourage you to chat with us and with each other throughout the webinar. To do so, just click the chat icon in the bottom middle of your screen to activate that feature. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section. And if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag DA Strategies. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the recording of the session and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you the speakers for today, Becky Russell and Donna Burbank. Becky is the National Lead for Data Standards at the Environment Agency, a role she has held since 2013. Previously, she had held several other jobs in the Environmental Agency, including leading a data a team and both managing a team and acting as a technical specialist to regulate industrial activities and implement European legislation. Becky is a qualified chemist and in uh, and, t <laughs> and initially joined the Nestle through their graduate program before working at for Cadbury's and then the Environment Agency. Very interesting, very nice. And now let me introduce the speaker of the series, Donna Burbank. She is a recognized industry expert in information management with over 20 years of experience helping organizations enrich their business opportunities through data and information. She is currently, currently the Managing Director of Global Data Strategy Limited, where she assists organizations around the globe in driving value from their data. She has worked with dozens of Fortune 500 companies worldwide in the Americas, Europe, Asia, and Africa and speaks regularly at industry conferences. In fact, she was just with us at Enterprise Data World last week. And with that, let me give the floor to Donna to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Thank you, Shannon. Always a pleasure to do these. Um, and thanks for some of the familiar, I would say, faces, but names, <laughs> although some of the folks, as you mentioned, we were able to meet last week at Enterprise Data World in Boston. Uh, and for those of you, this is your first time on the webinar series, welcome. Uh, the good news about any data diversity webinar, and always the, the top question is, 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 is this recorded? And yes. So any of the past webinars that you see there on data architecture or data strategy are on demand on both the data diversity website as well as the global data strategy website. And any of the upcoming uh, topics that may be of interest to you, uh, we'd love to have you again. This particularly, I'm excited. So Becky, Russell, and I work together on this data model um, with several others on our team. Um, and data modeling is always one of the hottest topics at Dataversity. To have sort of a real live use case, I think, is sort of fun. And I think it's a, as you look through, um, it's a really interesting application. Um, who doesn't love animals right? <laughs> and water and, and nature? And, and so it's a little different than your standard banking or you know industry use case. So I thought for many reasons, it's a really great story of how we actually got some scientists and um, you know, environmental chemists and things like that actually using data models. So for those of you who say business people don't and can't use data models, I, I, here's a great example where these were really business stakeholders um, using data models to do their job. So if we could just go to the next slide. Um, I, I, you've seen this slide before. I've showed this at a lot of our you know, presentations. And what I thought might be helpful is to show you, we, I talk a lot theoretically in these different sessions about things like strategy and governance and architecture and metadata and modeling. Well, this webinar today will actually be some real world examples, especially around data architecture, but you'll see how it tied into a larger metadata management um, and things like uh, standard lists. And, and um, you'll, you'll see a lot of some of the actual metadata standards that were used for the Environment Agency um, to really help them do their job, which helps with governance, right? So this was sort of, Becky will talk a lot about how people sort of self-collaborated together uh, to really get some of these standards really buying into that business strategy. So I use business here, but this is obviously a government organization, and their business is the environment. So this is a really great use case for some of these building blocks we've been talking about over the past months and years for some of you. So if you go to the next slide, many of you who are data modelers on the call will sort of recognize this pyramid. Everyone has their own version of it. Um, right, what we'll be talking about mostly today are the ones in the blue. So we, we started up at the conceptual la layer. Um, we also went to the logical layer, because if, if you've heard me speak or others who speak about data modeling, it really is those levels is about communication and defining core concepts. 
And yes, we also will show you, we'll talk a little bit about some of the, the physical implementations, and we did do some reverse engineering um, as well. But the main focus here was on communication. In fact, when Becky first came to us years ago now, um, I loved it because it was a, you know, Becky, is, as Shannon mentioned in the beginning, is a qualified chemist. She's a scientist. You know, <laughs> she's technical, uh, but she's not technical as we say in sort of data modeling. And she said, you know, I, I've heard about things, things called data models, and I don't know how to build one, but I know I need one. <laughs> and she was sort of the best learner very quickly um, because it, the best thing about data models is they're just very logical and very intuitive. So Becky knew the business. We knew some of the artifacts, and I thought that was a nice combination of, and this happens often, um, and it happened with some of Becky's stakeholders. She'll talk more about that. Of you know, it took a few minutes, you know, literally five to ten minutes to explain a model, and then people dove right into it and because you were talking about their day job, and we were able to help with that. So if you go to the next slide, you've heard me say this before. If you've joined the the, the, the meetings, uh, the webinars. Um, the beauty of these high-level data models is that they do tell a story. So this is kind of a facetious cartoon from one of my books. And yes, there are data modeling cartoons. <laughs> and my co-author, Steve Huberman, claims that he actually reads data models to his children, the poor things. Um, but in, in a normal business environment, when a data model is success, uh, successful, part of the reason it's so successful and so easy to understand is that you're using, quote, the language of your audience, right? We're not getting into tables and columns and you know, although we did in this case, that's not what we showed to the business user. We showed their terminology, their story. Um, and any of you who are data modelers or have done data models on the call, you'll realize that that language can be different. So what one person might call, actually, it was funny, I was laughing about the song before we joined, you know, potato, potato, <laughs> you call it one thing, someone else calls it another. That's classic with data modeling. And we ran into that at the Environment Agency, where, and I don't want to steal Becky Thunder, but that was a lot of the, the aha moments of we were, different teams were really doing similar things and calling them something different, or calling them the same thing with a slightly different meaning. So a lot of the effort was around getting that common language. Um, so if we go to the next slide, um, I want to pass it over to Becky to really talk about her work at the Environment Agency and how we kind of use that language to really get the stakeholders together. So I'll pass it over to you, Becky. Brilliant. That's lovely. Thank you very much, Donna. So um, hi, everybody. I'm Becky Russell, and I'm what's called the National Lead for Data Standards at the Environment Agency. And I'll talk a little bit more in a moment just about the Environment Agency and our work. Um, but as Donna said, I am technical, I suppose, but from a science point of view. Um, rather than a, than a data modeling point of view. And I think um, you know, that will become evident throughout the conversation through the presentation that actually, yeah, I've got technical skills, but actually it was the data modeling. You'll see how we sort of had the moment where we suddenly realized that we needed a data model. Um, the other thing is around my role at the Environment Agency is I'm very much focused, or I started off with my focus, around standardizing data, which literally meant kind of the terms that we use to describe things or the way in which we record location. So it was very much down in the detail of the data, not at the data model level. But again, it became evident throughout our work and throughout our story that that was where I needed to move to. So just to give you a little bit of background to the Environment Agency, because it kind of puts the whole kind of story in context. So we are an agency of about 10,000 people um, regulating the environment for England only. So Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales have their own organisations. Um, and we have a huge breadth of kind of activities that we do. So we regulate industries from very small sort of factories, maybe doing some sort of surface metal treatment works, through to intensive agriculture, through to the biggest power stations that there are in, in England. Um, we have a particular focus on the waste industry, uh, where we do quite a lot of prosecution and enforcement work, actually, because people like to throw their rubbish in places that they're not supposed to. Um, we do sort of more positive work, I suppose, in the sense of we protect habitats for wildlife, and we sort of manage wildlife. We reintroduce fish stocks to rivers, um, you know, and we kind of make sure that the habitats are maintained. We also get rid of um, invasive species and things like that to make sure that our habitats are stable. We also do a huge amount of monitoring um, of air, land, and water quality. Um, and we're responsible, for example, for publishing that data, particularly in the summer months for bathing waters around the coastline of England, where people want to check if the water is clean enough for them to go swimming in. I think the problem often enough is whether it's warm enough, but people seem to want to know whether it's clean enough. 
Um, we also regulate sort of recreational activities around water, so fishing, rod licensing, and boat use. Um, and finally, probably our biggest piece of work, and the one that we're most well known for in England, is our flood defence work. So we have a huge portfolio of predicting and modelling the impact of floods, um, building flood assets to protect our homes and our sort of, you know, um, utilities, um, but then also responding in the event of a flood. So we have a huge breadth of what we do. I work at the national level. Um, so I kind of work across all of those potential activities or can be asked to support a particular activity at a particular time. So we have got a huge sort of number of activities that we do. So what does that mean for our data? Uh, so this isn't a particular a pick a picture of any particular um, data set or you know, database. It's just a representation of what our data looks like. It's also much too simple. Uh, we have about 850 applications holding our data, so uh, much more complex than it looks here. What's interesting to note, though, I think, is that we arrange our data in the same way that lots of other big organizations do, which is around the activity that the data is held for, or within a particular business domain. Um, we're an organization of about 20 years old, um, and I think 20 years ago, it was fine to hold data in silos and manage it in that way. Increasingly, we now really need to join the data up across those systems. We need to get a big picture of what's happening in the environment. Um, and one of the big problems that we've got, one of the big barriers to doing that, is both the definitions and then the standards that actually apply to the data underneath that as well. You can see here, it's not particularly spectacular, but the word catchment sort of comes out of the screen at you. So catchment is a really important concept for the Environment Agency. It's kind of, it's a, it's, uh, to try and describe it, it's like an area of land from which water flows into a particular water body. So it kind of talks about, you know, if you have pollution in that area, it can end up in that water. But it's a really important concept and it's used across many of our business domains for monitoring, improving the environment, measuring things, reporting. Um, and we knew we actually had a problem um, with this data because, and you wouldn't believe it, but there have been some very, very heated debates about whether sections of river should be called Upper Avon or Avon Upper, but there have been plenty of debates of that nature. So we knew that this was a problem, and actually one of the very early pieces of work that we worked with Global Data Strategy on was a catchment standard. So again, talking about standards rather than models very much at the bottom up. Um, but what was really interesting was when um, Global Data Strategy did the business analysis to try and understand what was happening and, and you know, why the lists were in a different state, we actually discovered that we had a fundamental misunderstanding of what we meant by catchment. So there was a whole group of people who kind of had the idea that it was some sort of hydrological area. There was another group of people who thought it was something to do with environmental monitoring, other people who thought it was to do with water abstraction, other people who thought it was just there for reporting purposes, and finally someone who thought it had something to do with schools, which was quite an interesting concept. So I think we realised at this point that actually you can't, you know, solving the problem of whether you call it Avon Upper or Upper Avon is not really relevant at this point. You actually have to come to a single definition of the word catchment. And I think this was kind of the point at which we started to twig that definitions were really important. However, I would say in the Environment Agency that actually in addition to the definitions and of, of those entities, the data that we capture about those also has to be consistent. So the picture you can see on screen there is the head office of the Environment Agency uh, based in Bristol down in the southwest of England. And it's known as Horizon House, that's its name. Oh yeah, and five other names as well. So it's known by six names. I think the building's only about seven years old, so I'm not quite sure how many names it'll have by the time it's 20. Um, but clearly, that is actually a problem. Now, as a human, we can interpret that those names are the same building, but a machine can't. Um, and we, you know, we have to be able to report on things that are happening around the building, or people have to find the building. And talking of finding the building, we even have to control things around location data. So that's the building actually plotted using three different coordinate reference systems, and the building moves. Now, we're fairly close to the datum point, so actually the difference between them isn't huge, but it could be the difference between receiving a flood warning, for example, which is based on location. 
So those are kind of um, the, the problems that we face. Um, it's very easy, I think, to, to look at these problems as academic and theoretical problems. So, yeah, it's nice to look at pictures of data and say, we need to join this up, or to look at different definitions and say, yeah, they should be the same. But that kind of remains sort of like, yeah, that looks like, you know, theoretically a good idea to do. But to actually make these definitions the same takes a lot of business effort and a lot of business energy. So actually, we need to understand why we need to do it. What's in, why, does, why does it matter that we need to, to standardize our data? I won't talk in too much detail about this example, but just very briefly, this is us again with our flooding um, sort of uh, responsibility. So in the event of a flood event, so you know the rain is falling and the rivers are rising, we are sharing huge amounts of information with a lot of people very, very quickly, and it's a very rapidly changing situation. So we'll be taking you know, measurements of river levels and river flows um, and taking pictures of where things have flooded and using that information to warn the public that actually there are floods coming their way and they need to do something about it. We are talking to our own teams to tell them where to put temporary flood assets, where to sort of put the pumps in to get rid of the water. We need to understand where our, where our vans are, where our equipment is. We need to understand where our people are and what skill sets they've got. We're also talking to government to give them constant situation reports for what's happening. And perhaps most critically, we're talking to other emergency responders as well. So someone like the fire brigade. And you can imagine that if we give a location or an address for a property that needs to be evacuated that is misunderstood by the fire brigade because they have a different standard way of representing it, we could end up evacuating the wrong properties, which could have some you know, severe impacts. Um, even after the event, the data is actually really critical. We use it to... Um, to plan um, and to decide where to build the next big flood defences. So the, the picture in the bottom left there is actually one of our big floodgates outside the city of York. Um, we also share the data with insurance companies um, so they can actually make better you know, judgments of insurance properties. And we work with local authorities um, to improve the overall kind of flood response. So there is a real business need for us to do standards. And I think it's important to make sure that you know, we don't get lost in the academic Sort of situation. So just moving on, um, so I'm going to sort of tell you I suppose the story of the particular example that, that we have done in the Environment Agency. So we've sort of um, gone on a journey I suppose to try to talk in a common language about chemicals. Um, so I'll try and sort of explain the journey we took both a little bit technically but also how we gained the business support and kind of brought them with us on this journey which was essential. So the business actually came to us with a problem. Um, we were building, or the development agency was building a, a new application to gather all of the monitoring data from our regulated sort of operators. So we've got lots and lots of people all you know, operating little factories or landfill sites or waste sites. And as part of their authorization to, you know, to, to carry out their activity, um, they have to send us regular information about the chemicals or the other parameters that they might be emitting to the environment. And we have got thousands and thousands of these operators. And at the same time, we are also doing an awful lot of monitoring in the environment ourselves. So what are the chances that all of those thousands of operators and all of our own staff are all using the same chemical names for the same chemicals? Yeah, not a chance, absolutely not a chance. So this project approached us and said, you know, we need to be able to standardize these chemical names to a single list so that we know what we're talking about and that we can share information and we can, you know, understand the bigger picture. So I thought, well, okay, this will be this will be fine, you know, I am I'm the national standards lead and actually I'm a chemist, so this this shouldn't be too bad. So um I thought chemicals this might be quite easy, might be quite nice. How wrong could I be? Um, so first of all, um, chemicals themselves, the chemical list, is actually inherently complex. Um, there is no single international master name or master list of chemicals or a master identifier. So actually there are aliases within the sort of global community for chemicals. There's also a lot of hierarchy and groupings, so it adds to the complexity of that chemicals list. 
But even more complex than that, when we started diving into our own databases to, to get the chemical names out so we could understand what we got, we also found information that wasn't a chemical, things like conductivity, the size of something, the shape. Uh, people on a beach, I think, has to be one of my favourite things that I discovered we measure. We also discovered in their information about the methods used to sample or to measure uh, for those chemicals, and we also actually found the units of measure themselves all kind of squished together in a field called chemicals. But not to be put off, I thought, okay, well, we can still create a list, nice controlled list of chemical names. So we took out all the erroneous information, we took out all the things that weren't chemicals, we took out all the monitoring methods, and we took out all the units, and we do duplicated the list. And to be honest, we felt quite proud. We had a nice, clean chemicals list. Um, and we gave it to the business to ask them to check, and the feedback was terrible. And uh, it took us, you know, a little bit of time to sort of understand what had happened. And actually, what had happened was this. We discovered there was no common understanding of the words or the concepts or the entities around chemicals or measurement at all. So there was a big disagreement about chemicals versus parameters results versus set of values, measurements versus monitoring, and then what about the non-chemicals? Actually, they do need to be represented. And I think what we finally realized was that um, all of these applications had different data models. And to add complication, because they were quite old, in some instances where the business requirement had changed slightly, redundant fields were being used to capture data that really didn't relate to the name of that field at all. So there was quite a lot of misunderstanding. So an absolute recipe for miscommunication. And this is why the feedback on that list was so bad, um, because everybody understood a different thing by chemicals. So I think this is the moment where Donna talked about earlier, uh, where the penny finally dropped and I kind of went, oh, I know this isn't right. I know we've got to do something and I think I need a data model. So I knew that we needed to understand the concepts around chemical measurement, and we needed to identify and define each entity really clearly so that we could say what was a chemical and what was a unit of measure and what was a measuring, a measuring method. Um, and we needed to understand their relationships and their logic. But we did also face a problem. I realized that that's what we needed, that all of the intelligence that we needed to kind of build that data model, the people who understood what these things did mean or perhaps should mean, were all out in the business, all really busy people with their own objectives and their own targets, trying to do their own work. So how are we going to bring them on board and convince them to give us some time to work with us on this data model? So before we kind of leapt in, um, we took a moment just to I suppose, decide on some sort of principles of engagement, I've called it. And I think the first major one that we decided was that we were going to take a consensus approach. So we were going to try and create this data model using the consensus of, um, of, of our, our business partners, our stakeholders. I have been criticized for that. I have had people ask me why I don't just take an external model and basically mandate it, force it onto the environment agency. Um, but actually the business culture is not right for that. It wouldn't be at all successful. The second kind of principle we have is that um, we're going to actually solve a real business problem. There is no point in choosing something which is theoretical. It actually has to be a real business problem which is hurting the business now that they really want to solve. And kind of related to that um, is the fact that we want it to be business-led. We want them to be asking for this and to be needing it and having the problem, not us just sort of really tapping them on the shoulder saying that we think they should have this, they really need to want it. The other principle we had was to use our existing networks. We're quite fortunate we have a very well-established data custodian network within the Environment Agency, um, so it made sense to add sort of data standards and data modeling to their, to their remit and their responsibilities um, because they're already familiar with you know, being responsible for data. And it also gave us a group of people to start talking to. We also wanted to be very transparent about how we were working. Um, so we had to think quite carefully about the technologies or the platforms in which we might share information with the business because we wanted everything to be in the open. We sort of didn't want to go away and do work behind closed doors. 
And finally, and this is a crossover from one of my sort of technical principles around both data standards and data models, but it was useful here as part of our engagement principles as well, is that this applies to new IT only. And again, that was really important um, with the business because it enabled them to sort of what's the word, leave behind their concerns about their current systems and how this might fit and how it might work. And it stopped them being kind of protectionist about their current data. And it allowed them to sort of free up their mind a little bit and think about actually for the future, if we were to do this properly, what would that look like? And I actually think that was a really important distinction to make. So having got our sort of principles, um, we didn't quite know how we we're going to make all of these things work, but we had these principles about how we wanted to work. We needed just to take some first steps. So the first thing was really, um, if I wanted to have people's time, I actually needed to get the support of all their managers and directors. So I spent quite a lot of time going out to management meetings um, and directors meetings to, to explain what we were trying to do, to explain the importance of what we were trying to do and the problems that we might be able to solve so that they would basically allow me to call on the time of some of their staff. Once we'd done that, we made sure that we communicated widely um, across our business using sort of existing networks and people that we knew, but also using things like internal social media platforms um, to, try and, um, to try and access or get to all the people that we needed to. And finally, once we sort of got this big group of people, I suppose we kind of whittled it down a little more um, into a much smaller group of specialists with whom we were going to work to really take this data model forward. And it was at this point that we actually realized we needed somebody to come and do data modeling. I'm not a data modeler. Um, so at this point, we actually needed the support to come and do the work with us. And this was the point at which we were fortunate enough um, to be put in contact with Donna and Global Data Strategy, who not only are data modelers, but critically understood the importance of the business culture element of this for the Environment Agency, and actually were very supportive in working with us to make sure that our business culture sort of part of this package and part of this work was successful. And I think, Don, I'm handing back to you now just to talk a little bit more in detail about the work you did with us. Okay, great. So I think Becky talked about a lot of the concepts um, that we data modelers often face, and that one of the questions I often get is, is, where do you start? Do you start from the top down with the business language? Do you start from the bottom up? And where do you begin? Um, and the answer is yes, right? <laughs> so, and I think the examples we'll give and that Becky already did give really was a good example of doing both. So sort of that top down where we spent a lot of time and Becky did even pre-work before we even came on site you know, with getting buy-in from the stakeholders, understanding all of the different terms and, and, and ways of looking at the world existed in the organization and, and making sure we got the, the right breadth of, of people because getting those core terms is very important. But we also looked from the bottom up. Um, as Becky mentioned, there were a lot of different existing systems, and that's where some of the different terms did come, because each tool used its own technology or its own data model, as you're aware. So what we did was really that iterative approach, and I would feel, I felt that both of them were equally important. So, so and we'll go through this in some examples of sometimes when there was a term we weren't quite sure why that term was, was used or why there might be a difference, we went to the physical implementation, and sometimes that helped give us some clarity. Sometimes, conversely, when we were down in the weeds and looking at the attribution entities, it was helpful to sort of zoom out and, and look more at the – what are we talking about anyway? These, these look like they're different fields, but – and Becky was really great with that of sort of how – let's step back. Is this the same as a measurement or, <laughs> or a sample? And, and, you know, I know that sounds so strange um, when you're outside of it because these are just simple terms we use every day in, in just the regular world. But when you're thinking of scientific measurements, it's a big deal. Um, I saw one of the comments in the in – the, in the chat, and I, and I think Becky addressed it as well, of, you know, can't you just take an industry model? Um, well, with any industry model, uh, that doesn't match an, a, a way of working of any organization. So, of course, they're always good to start with, I would say, regardless of the industry um, or the organization, but every organization is unique. And even with standards, which one, right? <laughs> There's many. So I think standards are great. We did reference some. We did take a look at other, other – um, I know when we were building the model, we looked at the U.S., we looked at some of the EU – other agency that were doing this work as sort of a reference. So we did not do it in a vacuum, but culture, as Becky mentioned, is so important and you need to pick the right battles and use the terms that people are using. So uh, Becky mentioned that, you know, her sort of mantra was, you know, don't take something a standard and force it upon people. So there's that cultural aspect. And I think 
everywhere that's the case, or very often that's the case. Of you know, people have already been working a certain way, so pick your battles. If, if it works, you know, 80% is right. Keep that 80% and, and tweak what you need to. So it was an iterative approach. And if we go to the next slide, um, ta-da! This is a, a subset of the actual model. Um, and it may look different than a lot of other models you've seen, that partly with a lot of the subtyping and supertypes. So I often get the question, you know, in, or so we get academic in the modeling world, oh, you would never show subtypes or supertypes in a conceptual data model. And this is a conceptual data model. And I use them all the time. Because I think this is the one of the easiest concepts to understand. And we did a little data modeling workshop, and you know, or data modeling 101 with each of our <laughs> workshops. And it lasted all of 10 minutes or five minutes. You know, you could have... I don't know, uh, a person could be an employee or a customer. They can be both, or perhaps they cannot be both. You know, supertype subtypes are very easy to understand. And that really helped us doing this detailed subtyping really understand. We have a measurement. Okay? We have air measurements and soil measurements and water bodies and organisms. And, and if we step back at its core, are we just measuring things? And, and we went back into the attribute level to really understand, which we'll, we'll go in a minute. But I think just really going into the detail to sort of see what's different and then what's the same helped us with some of these very high level terms and, and you know arguing about things like uh, is an, a monitoring event different than the measurement we're monitoring and the sample from that event that those three entities I think took to quite a bit of time and what about the parameters that we're monitoring in that event and these are very important when you're sending these uh, terms back so if we go to the next slide we'll show you an example of some of that detail um, Oh, actually, we won't. We'll talk about some of the workshops. Um, and this is a great, Becky talked a lot about uh, getting the buy-in. And I think one of the biggest successes of this was these workshops. And I think we were all, correct me if I'm wrong, Becky, I think we were all a little nervous going into the first one. Um, you know, Becky mentioned that she didn't do data modeling every day and, and had a day job, but saw the value. But she had sort of already had that light bulb go off before the meeting. And so we were challenged not only sort of moving people's cheese, as they say, right? They're used to doing things a one way, and now we're going to be asking them in some cases to change, but also introducing them to a completely different concept that, you know, we were afraid might seem too nerdy. Um, and I think people grasp onto it right away. So we, we really did, this is not an actual picture of the scientists. Um, no, just kidding. Um, we, we actually did sort of a, we had a draft model, so we often get questions, you know, where do you start? Do you do just whiteboarding? Do you have something to start with? I think it was helpful we had a draft. We had done our research. We did sort of a bit of a top-down um, and a bit of a bottom-up. And then we had enough to start, but we were flexible. We did not come in and say, this is thou shalt, this is how it is. We came in and we asked. Um, and I think that moves. I think that, that, you know, the attitude, I think, went a long way. And we, we did have a lot of arguments and personalities. And I think it probably took a few workshops to realize um, I don't know, <laughs> uh, to realize that we were on their side and I think showing that we did make some changes and listened. And, and it wasn't just the workshops. I think we had a lot of pre-meetings before the workshop and a lot of post-meetings because if you're working with people, as you know, people react differently in groups as they do individually. So I think you know, part of it was the pre-work that Be Becky did with managers and the entire team. It was pre-work our technical team did with people individually to really understand and listen. We did a playback and we iterated. So the iteration wasn't just with the top down and bottom up. It was also with the business stakeholders and listening and, and repeating. And, and I think that was a big part of it. So if we go to the next slide, uh, this was the more bottom up approach. Um, and when we sort of talked about the, um, the some of those super types and subtypes, this I know was very helpful to me not being a chemist. I liked chemistry in school, but we can only do so many things in life. Uh, so I, that's one of the reasons I found that the other side of my nerdery came out, and I found this fascinating. Um, but what we did was really look at a lot of the ways people were sampling and taking these measurements. So that might have been systems, it might have been existing standards, and we really went down to the attribute or, or column level in the database. And that's often how we found out were these things different. So. Um, you know, how is it? Is an air sample the same as a water sample? Well, there's certain things. We have a parameter, and we have a time, and a place, and the asset that monitored it, and, and et cetera, and the value. So in that sense, it was different. Um, but, you know, the source stream of that air, air type or the emissions type, et, or et cetera, are very different than maybe a, a land body or a water body. So we, we actually were able to kind of use those attributes to help us understand were these things the same I think one of them had to do with water bodies, and we thought they were the same thing until we started looking at the, the values, and I think one of them was talking about 
really the shore and how high the shore was. That's really the, the land body associated with water, not the water itself. That, you know, it's not the values of the chemicals in the water. So, again, it was a mix of going down into the details of the systems, of the, you know, the actual measurements people were taking, and then going back up and really understanding how people spoke you know, in their daily job. So if we go to the next slide. Um, this was even going a higher level up. Um, so in that pyramid, we sort of talked about you know conceptual and logical, and this was more at the enterprise conceptual layer. So in this partly, um, we sort of nerded out um, extra. Just I mean, this wasn't something we planned to build um, when we were working with Becky, but partly, I know I need to do this, and some of our consultants felt the same way. When when Becky was was talking about the organization earlier on the call, my mind, and I'm sure some of you in the call admitted it. Um, you sort of started doing entities and attributes. So what do we do? We do flood protection, and we have you know um, local authorities we work with at certain locations. And, and whenever I hear an organization, I start to create the nouns. And the first thing I have to do when I work with any company is really understand what it is, right? So that little introduction that Becky gave you, she gave us, and we sort of did this very high-level model. And one of the reasons, so there were several reasons. One is just it's a great... Um, Education for us, if nothing else, or someone new coming in, what does the EA do? It also helped with prioritization of what, what, what piece are we working on, because as you know, when you go top down and bottom up, the easiest thing is to sort of keep iterating and then you start to get out of scope. Oh, what about this? Why don't we? And we had to sort of keep ourselves in check through this model. You know, we're looking at the natural environment at the bottom and we're trying to do samples. Um, but there's a lot of other pieces, so that helped. The other thing that helped when we step back in the prioritization, Becky will talk next about some of these data standards. And I think it sort of also helped it with so what, as they say, about some of these models. They really helped build some of these control lists. And so we did this mapping, and it's also kind of a future state, you know, what have we done, what do we need to do in terms of when Becky was talking about the flood sources control list or the what is a catchment. And I know that sounds... You know, any of these terms, when you say any organization, what's an address, what's a catchment, what's a location, and why are they different things, can seem so academic and abstract until you start to use some of those real-world examples. And I think some of the real-world examples Becky mentioned of, you know, this actually has an impact of, you know, someone may not be evacuated from their home. So I think that also kind of puts it in perspective. So I'm going to pack it back, pass it back to Becky to kind of talk more about these controlled lists that were generated as well. Brilliant. Okay, yeah, thanks, Donna. You'd be pleased to know, by the way, Donna, that the ones you've identified on there, local authorities, address have been done, location is nearly done, and catchment is, is in progress. So we have actually used your prioritization to, uh, to help us uh, drive things forward, which has been good. <laughs> Great. So, um, yeah, so just moving back, so as we say, we did, uh, I'll talk now about a little bit about creating the controlled list very briefly. Um, so yes, obviously there's an awful lot of work done to do the data model, and I think I will touch on it a little bit at the end, but I think what's interesting about that whole process about doing sort of the top down and the bottom up and working with the business is, you know, we started out really sort of having to bring the business with us, and I think it's fair to say that by the end of the process, they are, or they, and they still continue to be, incredibly keen and incredibly supportive of what we're doing. So I think that's been a real success of the project. Um, and I also think it's just educated people around data models and the importance of definitions. So there's actually now people out in the business who are also, should I say, sort of, you know, supporting that and, and, and you know, blowing the trumpet, really, for, for data models and data definitions. But just coming back a little bit to sort of creating the controlled lists or the standards, because ultimately that's where we started from. We wanted this chemical standard. So we've got our data model. Um, and as Donna said, you know, you can use it to identify where you might need standards or controlled lists. And indeed, the measurement one does. Um, but we already, chemicals was, already, was one of those controlled lists identified, and we already knew we needed it. So that was quite clearly our next step. But I suppose really the question was, do we go back and create a list of single chemical names. Now we've defined chemical and we know what it is. Can we just have our list with a single name and identifier and what have you on it? No, actually it's not that simple. So although we've got our nice definitions and we can now say what a chemical is and what it's not, and it is not people on a beach, that is not a chemical, you know, nor is it a unit of measure, nor does it include kind of um, sampling methods. Um, um, sorry, I've lost my, lost my train of thought there. Um, I've gone completely blank. Sorry, Donna. What was I saying? <laughs> you were saying 
you were talking about like, trying to get a list of the chemical substances, and it's not somebody on a beach, and it's not a. Standard. That was it. Sorry. Yeah. So even though we've got the <laughs> definition, sorry, thank you, Donna. Even though we've got the definition, absolutely, you know, nice and tight and defined, we can't just create a simple controlled list. The chemicals list itself is just too complex. And I think I mentioned at the beginning that actually there are multiple aliases. Um, that are quite valid in international sort of chemical communities. It is quite normal for different scientific communities to call the same chemical by different names. So there is no international standardization. And I think we've, we realized through this process that actually there were domains of the Environment Agency which needed to speak in a different language about the same chemical. So if you're working um, in farming, for example, and regulating farmers, you're going to call a pesticide by a trade name. If you're in the labs monitoring for that pesticide in the water, you're going to call it by its chemical name probably. But actually trying to get the two to speak the same language doesn't work. The other thing that was, came out of the sort of when we were talking to the business was they needed to know which groups these chemicals belong to, a really important concept. So is this a pesticide? Is it a persistent organic pollutant? Is it an Annex 4 pollutant or some other legislative requirement? They wanted to know which groups they belong to. So, um, it was, so what we had to do was effectively create a slightly more complex list and then use the concept of a register, which is where you can link controlled lists together. So very simply, we took, really this is right down in the data level now, we took uh, names from say the regulation domain and chemical names from the water quality domain, which you can see sometimes are the same and sometimes they're different, and then actually understand how they join up. I've made it easy for myself this time, they join up very simply. Now, clearly, that's a big piece of work to do that understanding. Um, but instead of just leaving it there with the translation table, which is useful up to a point, we kind of looked to add external identifiers, which might be useful as well. Um, but again, we couldn't find an external identifier, which, was, which actually identified every single chemical that we need. So we've decided to add our own Environment Agency Global ID. That's not actually the structure of it. It's just an example of how it, you know, of the fact there's a, a, there's a nonsensical identifier on there, just a globally unique identifier. So this was kind of the idea, is actually we'd build up slightly more complex controlled lists, which would allow for aliases to be represented, but each alias would still have the same global identifier. So in the future, when chemicals are used, not only is the chemical name recorded, they must also record that globally unique identifier. And that's what we can use to join our data in the future. And the label can therefore be a bit more domain specific because we know we're talking about the same chemical. So the advantage of these things is actually we can start to add lots and lots of other domain names if we need to. We could even start to identify a preferred term or a master term within the environment agency, which again, over time, we could move to, because as long as the identifier remains stable, we can start to get people to change their data. But interestingly, I think this is a bit where it starts to get interesting and starts to be more like a register, we can hold another list of chemical groups with a global identifier and link the two lists by their identifier. So then you'd be able to say that cyanide by its identifier belong to a particular chemical group. And you can start to represent the hierarchy and the complexity um, of the list that people needed. And then finally, of course, you need start dates and end dates so that you can manage life cycle and changes. So that's actually kind of our approach to solving. So, you know, we've got our definition. So we did the data model. We got our entities defined. We've got all the nice definitions. And now this is actually how we're trying to solve the puzzle right down at, these at, the, at the term level. So this sort of, I suppose, the experience we've had on this journey, um, we're still in the middle of sort of finalizing that register. Um, we've done, we're probably about 90% of the way there. Um, we've got to do some checking with the business, but we are sort of nearly at the end. So this kind of whole story has changed our approach, I think, to how we're doing data standards. We've learned quite a lot. So whereas previously we thought we would just create a data standard, which is what I tried to do with the chemicals list at the beginning and just create a controlled list, we now realize it's much more complex than that. So in some instances, not every instance, you also need a data model, which gives you the objects and definitions and identifies the standards, which then allows you to create them, potentially using registers where we need to link controlled lists to get added value, and then you can deploy it into your IT. So it's actually given us a much more enhanced process, and that's much 
that's much more appropriate for what we're trying to do. Uh, the other thing that is really useful, again, this is working with global data strategy, and this, this methodology is global data strategies. I don't take any um, credit for this, but it's a, it's a nice sort of repeatable process originally designed for producing our data standards, but can equally apply to data models or registers. Um, and it just sets out the steps that we will take in order to develop and define standards or models or registers. Um, it makes the process repeatable, but it also has helped us again with that business buy-in. If we can show the business and get them to agree that that process is acceptable, when we follow the process, they've got a lot more confidence in the outcome. So just moving forward then to some lessons learned from this journey, and I think we did learn quite a lot. You know, we set out with those principles of engagement, and we weren't necessarily sure how we were going to implement all of them. And I think we learned a lot through working with Global Data Strategy and that whole process we went through, which must have been, it was about six months, I think, we, we sort of worked with Global Data Strategy for on that particular project. So I think the first lesson that we learned is that, and I think Donna said this many times, but talking the business language is absolutely critical. The minute that something starts to look technical or unfamiliar or requires um, some real hard thinking to make them sort of imagine how it applies to their own business area, to be quite honest, you just lose them and therefore they just disengage. Um, creating these virtual teams is really powerful. Um, again, I think Donna mentioned that um, sort of at the workshops. But we even did that through sort of webinars as well. Um, and what was interesting was when we were working with our stakeholders, you know, we kept them as a group. We did webinars, we did workshops, we sort of kept them on, you know, email groups together. And it got to the point where, you know, they were arguing things amongst each other rather than arguing with us, which was actually quite a relief sometimes. It was quite nice that they did that. So that was a really powerful thing to do. Again, Donna's mentioned this, but the webinars and workshops, absolutely essential. There is only so much you can do electronically um, and although you have to be careful with people's time for workshops and they do take investment actually what you get out of them is, is you know really really important um, the other thing and again Donna mentioned this before but more shall I say from a technical point of view how the top-down and bottom-up analysis was needed to deliver the model technically I'd also echo that but say this was really important to the business engagement so the top-down type approach um, gave the business, they felt like they had been involved, they'd been spoken to, their input had been made to the data models, they were happy that you know they'd contributed, but they also wanted to see us do the bottom-up analysis to make sure that we had gone to the right level of detail to make sure that this was correct. So that was really important again from a business point of view. We learned that, to be honest, we just have to keep talking to people. People are very busy, and if you go silent for two or three months and then come back three months later, they can't always remember what it was they were doing. Um, so we needed to just keep telling people what we were doing and reminding them why it was important. And finally, the other thing was we must actually, we had to act on their feedback, even if that was to reply to them and just say, we've received your feedback and actually we don't quite agree with it for this reason, but what we must do is continue to act on their feedback. You know, you ask people a question the first time and they give you an answer. If nothing happens or they can't even see that their response was valid, then you go back a second time and they're not really prepared to, to work with you again. So it's really important to do that. And then finally, this is my last slide, you might be uh, pleased to hear, just some successes and benefits of this project. It, it was, you know, we did go down some rabbit holes, um, particularly I did, trying to do that chemicals list in the first place. Um, but it was part of the journey to get us to where we are now. And along the way, we've had some really big successes, I think. I think one of the big ones is we have started to solve problems that the business knew they had, but they didn't know why. And I have been into meetings where, you know, the sort of data people in a meeting room and I walk in and they know I'm going to talk about data standards or data models. And they've got their arms folded, really defensive body language. And after about sort of 10 or 15 minutes, they suddenly realize that this problem that they've had with their data that they haven't been able to solve is all because there's not been a data model. And suddenly the, the, you know, the body language changes and they really engage with it. So that's been really, really important. Um, the other thing, I think we've mentioned this a few times now, but the business support has been absolutely excellent. And I think that has been 
a success of our business engagement and how we work with them, that we've had incredible support from the business. Um, and we continue to do so. We continue to get emails, you know, messages now sort of, you know, asking where we are with things or offering for, you know, to help us. Um, when I sort of, when the penny dropped and I sort of spoke to Donna about doing a data model, I think I was the first person who'd mentioned data models in the Environment Agency. We've now got about four or five projects developing data models. Lots of people are coming to ask for them. So it's really interesting how I think those people that we spoke to in the business have gone out and have, you know, sort of, you know, told, sold the story of data models and other people are now asking for them. I think in the future, the work that we've done now, the journey we've been on will save us quite a lot of time. It's very easy for us to recognize now when a data standard just isn't enough and we actually need to do a data model. Uh, there are still some standards which can be done alone, um, but we're much quicker to recognize when we need a data model and that saves us an awful lot of wasted time. Um, and finally, this is probably a benefit for the future, really, because we're um, we sort of in, we're a regulator on behalf of UK government. We are required to make all of our data open, unless we've got a good reason not to, which means all of the controlled lists and the registers that we build will be made available publicly. Um, where we start to standardise, define, and create controlled lists or registers for concepts like catchment, which are used outside of the environment agency as well. We're actually starting to put together the building blocks for improved data across UK government as well. So the benefits extend much beyond the Environment Agency. So that kind of brings me to the end of my story. Um, I hope that was useful. I hope there's some things in there that perhaps you know rang true with your own organisations, or perhaps there's been some approaches there which you know you've taken, or, or perhaps some new approaches that we've tried. Um, I think it's important to say that you know this is a long journey. Um, this is the start of a journey for the Environment Agency, um, but the work we've done here has been really critical um, to add to our future success. And I think I hand back to Donna at that point. Sure. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, and um, just adding on one thing that Becky said about the workshops, I want to just iterate because I, I think it's so important is that you know a lot of having. What you, the one-on-one -on -one was important, but having other people hear from each other that they have disagreements and work it amongst themselves. AAU, the data modeling team, less becomes less of the issue. But I think people had their own sort of light bulb moments once they hear that other people did see it differently. Often, you forget this as a modeler. You've talked to the six different groups. They haven't talked together, so you might tell them that somebody else has a different definition. But it's really helpful for everybody else to kind of come along the journey with you. And um, as Becky mentioned, kind of give that continuous feedback was, I think, super important to this one. So uh, this will be on demand um, for those of you who want to watch it again or share it with a friend. Uh, next month, we'll be talking more about data management uh, with our other special guest, Nigel Turner, who is actually also on this project with Becky and me. Um, and uh, we'll be talking about some of the fundamentals of data governance. And so at this point, uh, Shannon, I know there were some questions that came in. If you wanted to sort of open it up for questions, Q and A. There's a lot of great questions, and if you have questions, feel free to submit them in the bottom right-hand corner in the Q&A section. And just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email to all registrants by end of day Monday with links to the slides and links to the recording of this. Um, and so let me just dive right in here. Uh, Becky, this question is for you. Any international environmental standards you are following in practice and the respective challenges of that? Um, so yes, we do. We do look to the external um, kind of international standards and, and particularly European standards um, as well. Um, I mean, there is a. I mean, particularly for chemicals, there is a European list of chemicals. Um, but again, it didn't quite sort of cover the extent of what we were trying to do. In terms of the data models, again, there are standards out there, but they just don't quite fit. Um, what we're trying, they don't quite fit our business, which I think was kind of one of the one of the challenges that we had. So I think what we've done has been inspired by external standards, but we've not been able to adopt them. I think the other problem, the other barrier to adopting external standards sometimes, particularly where you get to things like British and ISO standards, is they're chargeable standards. Um, and we're trying to be open across government, as I mentioned there at the end, and actually, there is a feeling that things like British and ISO standards don't necessarily fall into that open category because they are chargeable. So, you know, we might end up sort of being at odds with perhaps what, with some of the things that other people adopt. 
So also issues in coordinating cross agencies and cross disciplinary standards, and how uh, is the data? How does the data model help in that respect? Is that for me or for Donna? Probably both of you, you can answer. answer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you want to start, and I can chime in, or if you'd like me to start. Uh, you start. I'll chime in. Okay. Yeah. No, I think so. You were asking about cross cross functional standards. Is that I, I didn't quite hear you, Shannon. Yeah, so it also issue, uh, there are issues in coordinating cross agencies and cross disciplinary, discipline, uh, I can talk today, disciplinary oh, standards. Yeah, yeah. yeah, there we go. <laughs> and how the data modeling yeah. helps. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think that was one of the key findings when we were in, in the workshops helped with that. So when we had these workshops, they were different teams. So when we think of things like even just the soil or the water or the air samples. So those are different teams, and often they hadn't spoken to each other. Um, and so or had spoken to each other using different language. So I think part of it was, and, and I think Becky and I both spoke to a bit in the session, um, was knowing when to pick your battles. So in some cases it was important, of, you know, we're, we're all, we're, this will be an open standard. We must use the same terms. We must use the same control list. In some cases I think we had to sort of, you know, listen more and be a bit flexible, and that's why I think Becky's point of not just taking a standard and forcing it from above was really important. But yeah, this was very much a cross-functional effort, and, and I think that was one of the key benefits to really get that common language across, or at least a common understanding. Even if, again, Becky mentioned when, you know, some of the chemical standards, yes, you can use a little different term because what's a brand name is different than, you know, a chemical name, but as long as we have a common ID. Um, so as long as we can make that translation, I think it's fine. Yeah, and I think... You had yeah, yeah, just I was going to say, I think sort of where we went with that, wasn't it, was, you know, the definition had to be the same. So even though there was lots of people from sort of across disciplines, actually what we had to come to as a single definition, what we couldn't accept was having lots of different definitions of measurement because, you know, that, that just doesn't work. What, what we then worked hard to do with this kind of registers approach was to then allow the flexibility in the actual terminology used. So down in the detail, you know, yes, they can use different words for the same thing as long as they use our global identifier. So that gave them, shall I say, the sort of their domain flavor. But what we were quite sort of um, decided about, or what quite forceful about, I suppose, was actually the definition had to be consistent. So, you know, there have been some, there have been some interesting conversations, and I'm, I'm sure there's plenty to come <laughs> from people who <laughs> perhaps disagree. But, you know, in the end, the business benefit is there. So... And I think that helped too, that last point you made. I think people did have that common understanding that you had built even before we came on site, that people realized that there was a need for this, and then I think people can be a little more understanding if they have to make a change. Yeah. yeah. So how did you find some quick wins to build support for this initiative? Gosh, um, good That's question. Uh, yeah, good question. Um, to be honest, if I'm honest, we actually knew. Um, so within our organisation, because we are so we have we are so big, um, and within each of those business domains, there are kind of should I say data experts um, who support their own applications and who sort of deal with problems with these applications every every day. If I'm honest, we targeted those people first because we knew that they would be uh, far more easy to influence. They would already be quite um, supportive of what we were trying to do because they already they were experiencing the problems with bad data every day so those were the people that we targeted first to bring them on board so those were kind of the quick wins um, in terms of bringing people on board in terms of quick wins for actually doing data standards I mean they're probably slightly aside but actually we found sort of standalone lists that didn't really need data models and started to create sort of small standards around those to be able to demonstrate business benefits. So we kind of did two sides of that coin. Yeah, I think you're 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 right too. That once you you get one happy customer, everybody else is going to follow along, and you've already seen that, right? If I want some of that too, so I think picking someone that is a good already already is supportive is not a bad idea. You know, don't push water uphill if you don't have to. <laughs> You know, um, we, I think I have time to slip in just one quick question here. There's so many great questions. So, Donna, why did you say that people say you should never use supertype subtype relationship in a conceptual model? My understanding is that what um, they should 
practice in logical modeling, but they are an extension of ERD. I say that because people say that. Um, I don't. I don't agree with it. I, I think they. I, I do not agree. I think they're an excellent place in the conceptual layer for that very reason that they're a very easy way to sort of have um, you know, simple concepts explained. But I have gotten a lot of pushback, so people can tell me why they say that because I think you know the misconception I've heard that that's too complicated or it's too technical or they're maybe thinking physical implementation. Um, but don't get me wrong, I'm a big fan of using them, and I do it all the time, because I think they're almost a perfect example of that conceptual, is it this or this, or can they be both things at once? I mean, that's a very just simple thing to portray in a model. So, I'm a fan, so, um, yeah. That helps. I love it. Well, thank you so much, Donna, as always. And Becky, thank you so much for sharing your story. It's very much appreciated. It's been great. Uh, and thanks to all of our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. I'm afraid that is all that we have time we have for you today. Um, just again, reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday with links to the slides and links to the recording. Uh, and as all the inf great information presented here today. Uh, thank you both. Thanks, everybody. I hope you all have a great day. Thanks, Becky. Thanks, Donna. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.